Hello and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. The Russian Formula One Grand Prix has rocked Sochi for the second time. The greatest racing sport in the world continues to expand to new places thanks to its legendary leader who's been at the will of the enterprise for the last 40 years. Today, I sit down with Bernie Ecclestone to discuss the secret to his success. Bernie Ecclestone, it's so great to have you on our show today. My pleasure. So this is your second time in Russia, Sochi. Uh, was so good it last time that you had to come back the second time? It's quite surprising how people were always a little bit concerned about being here for the race, and now people can't wait. They're all happy to be here. But what's so special about the Grand Prix in Russia and in Sochi? Because it's kind of new for everyone. That's probably what's great, because it's new for everyone. But I've noticed from last year people seem to understand a lot more about Formula One. I know you've said that as long as I leave, there will be a Grand Prix in Russia, Sochi. Is it kind of difficult to do something like that in current political situation? Because, you know, there are so many tensions between the West and Russia now. I don't think Russia's concerned about the West. Russia is not, exactly. that's for sure. They, maybe the West concerned, <laughs> and they should be. There was this analyst, his name is Andrew Foxall, he's from the Russian Studies Center, and he said, you know, I think Formula One is Putin's attempt to show Russia's greatness through sporting events. Would you agree with that? What do you think? No, I mean, I don't think uh, Russia needs sporting events to be great and look great. I mean, it, what it does is exposes to the rest of the world what Russia is. That's the difference. I saw you watching Formula One with Putin last year. What do you think of the men? Super. I'm his best supporter. Yeah, cool. Um, I think one year ago you said about Formula One that it has become too democratic, that yeah. everyone just has to be too happy. Absolutely. Uh, so there's no place in democ for democracy in Formula One? I don't think there's any place for democracy, full stop. Ever? Anywhere? Anywhere. <laughs> um, it's funny you say that because for me, who is not a Formula One expert, I mean, I'm just an amateur, I've just observed you, you've just somehow managed to stay this splendid dictator for the last 40 years in conditions that somehow appear to be a democracy. How'd you manage? That's because it appears to be a democracy, perhaps. But that's the reason. <laughs> um, no, I think if you can get people to more or less fall in line with what you're trying to do and support you, then it seems like democracy, which is exactly what democracy should be, seeming like democracy. So what's that balance? How do you find that perfect balance between being the perfect manipulator and the perfect moderator? I don't know, I think um, it's one of these things that happen, isn't it? I don't think it... You can't teach people to do these things. You just have to have it in you? It's something yeah, that can be taught? Probably, yes. And you've got to have enough courage to do what you think is the right thing to do. So it's more about courage? It, well, it's, it's an essential part of trying to lead people. So when we talk about democracy, right, there is no place in a democracy, like you say, for like a strong leader with power. I mean, that actually completely contradicts democracy. You are that kind of guy, like who's really strong and very powerful, very charismatic. In a seeming democracy, who do you think is like you in that sense? Who is in that club with you in the comparison that I've just given you? Well, I don't know. It doesn't much. have to be a sports person, just anyone. Who do you think is in that club? <clears throat> You've got the perfect person here. Putin? Exactly. Anyone else? The trouble today in the world, we haven't got too many real leaders. You look at all the countries and if you said, well, try to pick somebody, it wouldn't be easy. You've got semi sort of people that think they would be doing that, but they're not. When, you know, I look at you, you've fended off so many challenges throughout your way while you were a boss of Formula One. You got scandals and you got court cases. Is it always just pain in the neck or it just gives you adrenaline and makes you go forward? No, I think I've been lucky. So luck is also indispensable for someone like you. 
I think everybody needs a bit of luck in their life. You know? How much is a little bit for, you know, to be at the position where you are? How much of it is luck and how much of it is your courage, like you said, and how much of it is the novice that you have? <clears throat> I don't, I never analyze these things. But you don't? I think I've been a bit lucky in life, in general, you know? I don't know if you've been asked these questions before, but, you know, there are other really great heavyweights in sports uh, that's been there for a long time. Um, I'm talking about Seth Blatter, but he's run into considerable trouble and he has to leave his post. As an observer, do you think he should have gone on and fought for it, or it's a good thing that he's stepping down? Just as an observer opinion. I don't think he should have ever stepped down, and I don't think he should have ever been challenged, because it's because of him we have a lot of countries throughout the world that are now playing football. <laughs> And if these people allegedly have been corrupted to make things happen in their country, it's good. It's a tax that football have had to pay. It's really hard to see one single person filling your shoe. Like, I mean, I don't know what it has to take for someone to replace you. Are you ever afraid of what may happen to Formula One? when you eventually leave someday? No, they'll probably find somebody doing a much better job than I've been doing. Come on. In a different way. No, maybe in a different, maybe somebody a bit more democratic. Are you afraid of anything at all? No, not at all. You have no sense of fear whatsoever. No. I know that you said that you want to tear up Formula One rule book. Why? I think a lot of our technical regulations are too stringent and it's really been like an old house and people keep adding bits and pieces to it and really nobody knows why we've added them. I'm as guilty as anybody else. Um, and I think so maybe we ought to tear it up and have another look. And we've become much too clinical with too many rules and regulations and I think the drivers, you know, when the lights go out to start the race, <clears throat> they should be on their own. Hmm. They shouldn't have help from the pits with advice and things. I also can't help but notice the new Formula One regulations proposal for 2017. It actually proposes, it includes to make cars faster, louder, more aggressive looking. I don't really know what that means, but um, I get a sense that it has become more about the show than sports. Am I wrong? Formula One in general. Is it all about the appearance? More, more about the sport. You think it's more yeah. about the sport? Than show, you know? I think we are in show business. The, the minute we stop entertaining, we're in trouble. So people like racing. I think well, our biggest problem is like here, you and I know pretty well, who, and we know who's going to be world champion this year. It can't be right. You know, when people go and watch a race or watch anything, they don't want to know the result before it starts. That's the rules book I want to tear up. Mm -hmm. so, I'm a political journalist, like I've yeah. told you, so I see everything in a political context. So when yeah. I look at Formula One, right, you're the president, now you have the legislative body, which is, you know, gives you regulations. You have the teams that are kind of like the parties, sometimes they're in opposition, sometimes they leave, sometimes they don't. Sponsors are sponsors, they're sponsors mm -hmm. everywhere, big corporations. And then I can't figure out the puzzle about the pilots. Who are the pilots in this construction? Or who are the pilots to you, personally? It's a bit, I mean, everyone's got their place, haven't they? I think that's what you're sort of referring to. And we've all got our job to do in whatever it is. I can't drive the cars, so we have to rely on the drivers. Uh, the regulators really are no different to the police force. They should make sure and all the regulations that we come up with are strictly adhered to. So sponsors come and go, obviously, and the teams come and go. But the drivers, I want to know who they are to you personally. I'll tell How you why I I'm feel a, about Yes, I want to, I'll tell you why I feel, because what, why I'm asking, because those, I'm crazy about soccer, so I, just, I saw once when Jose Mourinho uh, took to the victory Inter Milan, and then right after he announced he was leaving, and you had this huge Marco Materazzi was bawling, and they were just hugging. So at that moment, that just had me wondering forever, like, what is that relationship between the boss 
and the player. I mean, you and the pilot. Where where do you draw that line of emotional attachment? Is it just a function for you, a pilot, or is it someone that stays in your life forever, no matter what? Do you know what no, I mean? No, I think, you know, like, you probably you were saying before, but you get attached to some drivers. Some drivers are easy to feel for and be attached to. You know, I've been close to a couple of very good, good, good friends that have been killed. And so you are attached to these people. Each of them have got something a little bit special. I mean, we've just been talking to Hamilton just now. And uh, he, some things he wants to do. And he's thinking long term. So it's good to be able to encourage. He's come to me and asked me some things, but so he long term. When he stops racing, what am I going to do sort of thing? Mm -hmm. So it's good to have that sort of an association with the drivers. I can sense that you really like the guy Hamilton. You always talk about him very highly because you've said he's very good for business, for Formula One. He's super. So is it not enough just to be a good driver? What else do you have to have in order to be a star? I mean, he's Formula wonderful. One? He exposes Formula One. <clears throat> he's good. All the people like him. He's easy Why do you people. like him? Um, he's open, very open thinking person, and I think he genuinely wants to do good things for Formula One. I think he appreciates the business he's in. And we'll be back after a short break. We'll continue talking to legendary Formula One chief Bernie Ecclestone, discussing the future of the sport, and we'll also hear from world racing champion Lewis Hamilton. He joins us in the second part of the program, so don't go away. about double standards. Double standard that there is in Washington. Russia is responsible for fueling this war. Assad's war against his own people helped to fuel the rise of ISIS. By standing up for our values around the world, that is the way that we will keep our own people safe. How do you get away with such blatant double standards? We occasionally have to twist the arms of countries that wouldn't do what we need them to do. There you have it, simple. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Real. The only show I go out of my way to watch him. It really packs a punch. Wow. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. They do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the world bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. Uncovering hidden stories, moving against the mainstream, going to all lengths to bring real news to Britain. I'm Afshin Ritansi, going underground to bring you the stories that really matter, only on RT. From one fiasco to another, Washington has failed to change the regime in Syria, failed to effectively fight ISIL, and now wants Russia to fail. At the same time, Obama appears to be willing to arm any anti-regime fighter. What could possibly go wrong with that? Welcome back to Sophie & Co. For today's show, we travel to Sochi, where the Formula One Grand Prix was taking place. The Sports Chief Executive Bernie Ecclestone joins me to discuss why the racing championship is moving away from its traditional European venues and what the future holds for Formula One. Um, you know, even for someone who is an amateur like me, um, I've always watched these great epic battles take place between different race car drivers, like for instance you had, I don't know, Senna and Prost or Schumacher mm. and Villeneuve, you know, and they were like actual giants battling with techniques and you had movies made about it and videos and 
You don't really see that that much anymore. Why is that? I want to tear the book up <laughs> for that reason. Because, I mean, although Lewis is very talented, his car is so much better than anybody else's. Maybe not his guy that's driving the same team, but some of the other teams. So there might be a whole bunch of people down there that maybe are as good as him, and they're never going to be exposed and people to ever know. That's what's wrong. Who would you say is like the best pilot of all times? I'm not even asking about today, but like for you. I had a, a guy that was a partner of mine in business called Jochen Rind. He's an Austrian. Mm -hmm. He won the world championship, but he, he was dead when he won the championship, if you like, because he'd won it and then died after he won the championship um, in that same year. So, I had a lot of time for York, and actually because we were very close friends and good friends. And he was a very talented driver. But what made him so special that you think he's the best pilot ever? Just the fact that he was your close friend? He delivered what he had to, like most champions. You know, in anything, in tennis or whatever, the champions, when they have to deliver, they deliver. What do you think of Russia's Daniil Kvyat? Nice guy. Very, very talented. And he's one of the guys I'm talking about. Hmm. He's somebody that, if he was in the same car as Lewis, maybe could deliver. He's just at the moment in the wrong team. And I see the Formula One sort of moving to the east. You have Russia, you have Azerbaijan, Singapore, Bahrain. Do new racetracks bring more fans, more money? What's this movement eastward all about? Well, we're a world championship. I mm -hmm. always have said we're a world championship. We were more or less based in Europe. So it could hardly be a world championship. So when the opportunity arose to move, I mean, I tried to have a race here in the 80s. Um, so I've always wanted to move this way. Is there something wrong with Europe, with the old places like Germany and France? Why move away from Europe, though? Well, I think Europe's a thing of the past anyway. Hmm. So I think it'd be a nice place for people, China and even here and places to visit and look how the old times were, you know. It's not going anywhere. What other places would you want to see Formula One take place in? Well, we ought to try and beef up a little bit in America. That's kind of hard, isn't it, in America? It's hard for me. Why? Well, I'm not very enthusiastic about America. So... Why not? You certainly can't say that America is a thing of a past. Really, I mean, I don't know. The trouble is, I think, well, the biggest problem with them, I think they believe they're the greatest sort of power in the world. Yeah, that's what they're based on. They teach exactly. every kid that. No, yeah. believe. Believe. Mm -hmm. Not in reality, but in belief. And uh, it's difficult because they're, they're sort of isolated. They're a big island, so they're a bit isolated from the world. They're slowly starting to learn about what other people in the world do. If there is anything else you could have done except for Formula One, what would it be? I could have continued in my old profession. I was a used car dealer, so I could have continued doing that. I bought a race team and decided I was going to retire from business, travel the world and look after my race team and got caught up in things. Bernie, it was great talking to you. Thank you, Rich, for this interview and we hope to see you every year in Russia. Well, you will for sure. As long as you want me here, I'm here. <laughs> Simple as that. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And you know too much about Formula One for a bit a political journalist. So we were talking to Bernie Ecclestone, right, the boss of Formula One, and he obviously thinks for some reason that I know a lot about Formula One, which I really don't, but he thinks I know so much that I should speak to Lewis Hamilton. You mean Lewis Hamilton, who's dated like the best looking woman in the world? Yep. I figured it would be a crime not to speak to him. So he came like seven minutes right after Bernie. It was like a surprise interview. So I asked him how he found the tracks at the Russian Grand Prix. Uh, the track is, is challenging, um, it's, I mean, the 
when we arrive here, it's you know we were so well taken care of. Um, it's so beautiful. I didn't actually know that Russia had this kind of area. I knew that they had a beautiful city like um, St. Petersburg and, and Moscow, but I never knew that they had like a seaside. I don't know. I hadn't. That's not really shown to us in so Europe. So, what do you think you would see like? White bears walking like Red no. Square when you're coming here. No, but when, you know, when, when, you, when you're growing up in, in the UK, for example, you're just, yeah, when you see uh, Russia and, and Moscow in, in movies, for example, so you, it's, it's usually cold, people got their woolly hats on, so you, you don't actually realize just how beautiful the city is uh, or the place is when it, gets, when it gets warm. Would you ever come back, not for racing, but just, you know, for fun? You know, I really want to go to Moscow and, and to St. Petersburg, but mainly to Moscow to do some sightseeing. I've, I've been there and I've driven through there like in a day and worked, but I've never really gone, you know, backpacking. So that's, that's my goal. We've got such beautiful architecture there, so um, I'd love to see a bit more of the culture. But tell me something. Um, like I told you, I'm not a Formula One expert, but you know, I'm I'm no about you because you're a star. So your background is not like your regular race car driver's background. Like you didn't have it handed to you. You weren't like a rich kid who had his private karting. So you had it much harder than others. Well, that's what I think. Does it make you feel? Do you feel the advantage because you've had it harder and you have to overcome more obstacles to get where you are right now? Um, no, I see it as a, as, a, as a strength and I see it as, a, as an advantage, you know, it was definitely difficult for, for us as a family. My dad had four jobs at one stage to, just to keep me go-karting and um, yeah, I mean, we, and we were into a sport which ultimately was a white dominated sport, so for us to get in we had to, we had to put in the work, but you know, it, So was it, it makes your it, dream to do that? It was my dream to be a racing driver, yeah. My dad, as I said, my dad sacrificed everything, absolutely everything to make sure that you know, food was on the table, but also that we could drive. Such it's such, a, such an expensive sport. So you do see sometimes there are drivers that might have the talent, but others surpass them that have more financial backing rather than the talent come through. So I was very, very fortunate that I was able to come through. Um, and I think today that get that hunger that I had as a kid, um, driving a cart that perhaps was slightly worse than someone, you know, another kid's is what's enable me to be the champion that I am today. But you were like the youngest world champion. We're like 21 when I you know, won? I was 23. I was at the time I was the at youngest. At the time, you were yeah. the youngest. But I mean, back then you were like surrounded by huge metros like Schumacher. But when you won that, did you even understand the caliber of I what was going on? I didn't, no. 2008 was, was my second year. And I really wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't. I wasn't able to enjoy it. I didn't really understand what the hell has just happened. I don't know why, but um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I did last year. You know, I'm, I was 29, and I, I was able to just absorb it all, enjoy it, enjoy the, the fruits of, of my family's labor and my, my own. So hmm. it was a great feeling. I know that you're often compared to Art and Senna, the way you drive. You know, your style. You're rough and tough. Um, who is your Alan Prost? You'd say. Is there a such person out there? Um, I would, it's difficult to say, but I would imagine someone like, I mean, I think Alonso is probably, hmm. uh, if I said in my era, it might be Alonso, it might be Sebastian, I don't know, but um, those, those two are exceptional uh, drivers um, with who, of whom I'm looking forward to at some stage racing closer with. Because I was talking to Burley earlier that, you know, even for an amateur like me, like I've always observed these epic battles between, you know, Prost and Senna and yeah. Schumacher and Villeneuve, and you don't really see that that much anymore, and we wondered why. Yeah. Why do you think that is? It's difficult with Formula 1 because um, every team builds their own car, and every team starts at a different time in, in terms of development. Every team has different budget, and, and it's how you interpret the rules. Some One year, a team will interpret all the rules the right way, and it happens to to you know, get off on the right foot, like Red Bull did a couple of years ago, Ferrari did many years ago, McLaren did also, and then you know, last year we got off on the right foot with this new rules, and it's difficult then for others to catch up because you're constantly developing through the year, so um, which is a shame. But there, you know, there are times that you do get to see battles. You know, Ferrari have been very quick at some races this year, so. But overall, we've come up with a better package, and, um, and myself and Nico have been performing at our best because naturally we want to win the world championship. So. You know, the way Bernie talks about you, like, he, he's fond of you, not just because you're a good driver, but he just likes you. <laughs> and I feel like you have something in common. You all about breaking the rules. About breaking? Making the rules. Breaking the rules. Breaking the rules? Yes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what would you change in Formula One? He's not happy with the, with the current Formula One rule book. 
Um, I don't know. Uh, well, he does. He's done pretty well <laughs> for himself and, and for the sport. We wouldn't be here today with without his, you know, his genius. Um, I think. I guess more access, Formula One needs to be more accessible and uh, particularly for the fans, to in, more engaging with fans. In terms of racing, you know, we need to make cars that, that the car in front has the best downforce, the car behind has slightly less and, and furthermore. But um, if they give us more mechanical grip, maybe we'll be able to have more. If, you, if you've ever seen a go-kart race, mm, they yeah. go around like this and they have lots of overtaking because they don't have aerodynamics, it's just, it's just mechanical grip. So I think at some stage they're going to do some changes for 2017 where um, perhaps we can start getting closer and have more racing. But that's what makes racing, wheel-to-wheel -wheel races where you see people touching almost but, you know, making it through. What comes next to you? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it. You can't be a race car driver all your life. And that's like the, the adrenaline rush that you get there. You don't get anywhere. Have true. you thought of what you will do afterwards? But it's the same for... And not kill yourself from boredom? No, true. I mean, I try to keep myself energized doing lots of different things. I'm very, very open-minded. I do, I do all the sports I can possibly do outside um, as in a safe manner as possible. So I ride bikes, I ride buggies, I, I skydive, I do hiking and rock climbing, so I don't know, I think I'll, nothing will perhaps ever come close to what a Formula 1 car feels like, but there's so much to do in the world and there's almost not enough time for us all. So for me it's really about exploring, um, also I think it's, it's, I'm in a fortunate position to give back to kids, so um, that's something I want to do, whether it's create an opportunity in racing, whether it's Would you music, let your son be a race car driver? If he's driving and he's good at it, then of course I'll, I'll do everything as, as my father did. They want to take you away from me. Last question. I know that you said if I weren't a race car driver, I'd probably be a soccer player. Do you think you'd be just as successful? Like, would you be like a Messi in soccer? No, no, no I was never that good. <laughs> he's pretty amazing, but I mean, to be honest, I. I would have tried to have been a soccer player, but I don't think I would have been a top soccer player like uh, that awesome player. But um, I don't know. I would have probably followed in the family's business, probably in, in IT or something like that. But thank you so much for this interview. Pleasure. Great so talking to you. Yeah. Cool.